There's no game designer in the industry today whose style is more instantly recognizable to me than Hironobu Sakaguchi's. His approach is noteworthy not only because of how influential Final Fantasy has been to the industry in general, but also because it was integral to the emergence of a new genre for role-playing games, one which split from the tabletop tradition started by Dungeons & Dragons and gave rise to what we know today as the JRPG. After leaving Square in 2003, Sakaguchi founded Mistwalker, a studio that is most well known for designing games like Blue Dragon, Lost Odyssey, The Last Story, and Terra Battle. Their most recent project, Fantasian, was launched in April, and I had the pleasure of sitting down with Mr. Sakaguchi to ask him about his design process, inspirations, and challenges when it came to producing his latest fantasy epic. So these days, people say that the JRPG has diverged from the Western-style RPG, and your games were a big part of that divergence. Do you feel that you and your team made conscious design decisions to create the JRPG style? And if so, what were those decisions? I think there are flows, if you will. And in the game industry, there are very large, almost like meta-level flows of what or what direction the industry is is going in that perhaps kind of defines the types of games that that we see and i think everyone in that industry and players alike want to experience something beyond what has been done and you there's a certain flow that you either have to get on or 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 not and we i of course knew about this and i think that's been a part of my innov innovations that we've done in, in in the past of course myself playing games like Wizardry and Ultima really brought, made me fall in love with the RPG genre and ultimately led to the creation of the Final Fantasy franchise. And even before Final Fantasy, actually, I was making RPGs on PC. And as the name implies, role-playing game RPG, you have to play a role. So I didn't really focus too much on the characters or developing a really deep story in so much as I would more focus more on creating a world in which the player can fill certain characters shoes and that's again how I, how I thought in the beginning but having met Torishima-san of course he has a very strong background in manga where storytelling and character development is integral and how important that was and how he described that to me I think greatly affected my approach to making different uh, Final Fantasy characters and really putting an emphasis on the characters and story that's absolutely his influence on me if you can recall in Final Fantasy 1 the characters didn't really have names they were the Warriors of Light and you would kind of assign them jobs which is how you differentiate between the characters but that changed from Final Fantasy 2 onward so I think his influence in my storytelling and uh, character development is absolutely monumental. This new style of RPG that emerged during the NES era, but really came into its own on the SNES and PlayStation, separated what Japanese developers were doing from the rest of the world. For many of us who grew up with those games, it was the very reason they were so compelling and unique. And while JRPGs have continued evolving over the last three console generations, there was something about that orthodox formula that resonated with so many of us. This is precisely what Sakaguchi wanted to return to with Fantasian, regardless of current industry trends. This time what was unique about Fantasian is that I completely ignored this larger shift in the industry. And of course I recognize and acknowledge these certain divergences in, in the industry, but I think what Fantasian is, is perhaps 25 or 30 years ago when certain games had certain types of experiences and perhaps that branch or that diverging point in game flow history was already dead. All of a sudden I just grew a new branch out of this very old branch that I've kind of brought to the present, which is a very interesting blast from the past. And part of that is because I completely threw away that flow when I decided I was going to make Fantasian. Like whatever is happening in the game industry, whatever the fans want, this is the type of game I am going to create. And I recognize that not everyone might find it the most engaging or the most fun experience. But at the same time, I think it it was a good experience uh, for me and to kind of create this branch from 30 years ago and bring it back into the present. Additionally, there has always been something about Mr. Sakaguchi's style that feels distinct. There's a rhythm to his design philosophy, a sort of innate sense for pacing that is difficult to articulate. 
It seems like he always knows the right time to introduce a new mechanic, or a new vehicle type, or a revelation for the story, and conversely when to bring things to a close so that they don't overstay their welcome. It's something he's alluded to in previous interviews, referencing a formula he uses, so I wanted to get more information on how exactly he goes about structuring his games. This is, this is going to sound extremely simple, but as, as I write scenarios for games, I have my own kind of keys and legend that, that goes with that key. So I'll, I'll mark like either black square, maybe a black circle or a double circle or a triangle next to certain points in these scenarios or scripts for, for games. And each one represents some element. For example, a uh, black square might be a battle and one might represent a certain cutscene or event or some kind of story narrative driver. And I look at my entire scenario for the game and see the balance between all of these different uh, identifiers, the different keys of the game. And looking at the balance, I could kind of start to formulate, oh, hey, there's a certain percentage of this, or, oh, there's a lot of story elements here, so the players might get disengaged. Let's kind of shape it differently or, or structure the, the experience differently by introducing different parts. So it, it really, in a weird way, creates a certain rhythm throughout the game, which I always try to be very mindful and aware of as I'm constructing an experience. So I know it sounds very simple, but perhaps that's what you might be referring to. <laughs> Sakaguchi's passion for storytelling is well known among Final Fantasy fans and served as a shift in focus as a game developer that led to all of Squaresoft's success. While the company was struggling in the 80s, it was Sakaguchi who was quoted as saying, I don't think I have what it takes to make a good action game. I think I'm better at telling a story. This focus on strong linear storytelling with a cast of pre-established characters came to be a defining feature that separated JRPGs from their Western counterparts, which were more prone to give players blank slate character builders. This was, in large part, something Sakaguchi pioneered with the Final Fantasy series, and much of that was due to the influence of Kazuhiko Torishima, the editor of Shonen Jump. Torishima-san is absolutely, I owe so much to him. He's a big mentor in my life. And I would say it would not be an understatement to, to, to state that he is almost like the founding father creator of uh, the Dragon Quest franchise. And again, of course, he was in charge of Toriyama Akira in, in his heyday, and along with Hori Yuji, who was a writer at the time at Shonen Jump. But the, they, back in the day, got an Apple II and played games such as Wizardry and Ultima, and that was just so shocking to them that that ultimately led to them creating the Dragon Quest franchise. And you could say they were really at the inception of the entire JRPG genre. Incidentally, I completely unrelated happened to get an Apple II around the same time myself. I was still a student at the time, and again, it was just a huge culture shock. and. That experience is what brought me into the the video game industry. So again, I, I have so much respect for them. And even right now, of course, this past year, we couldn't meet because of the pandemic. But before the pandemic, we would meet perhaps two, three times a year. And we'd very passionately discuss a lot of different topics. And usually uh, Matsuno is also at these at these Ooh. meetings. But, <laughs> but uh, we talk about, of course, different games, storytelling, character development, uh, state of the industry. We're a very uh, unique kind of bunch that, that have these discussions with each other. One thing I've always admired about Mr. Sakaguchi's work is his ability to create captivating opening sequences. Whether it's Final Fantasy IV's intro, where Cecil kills innocence in loyalty to his king only to be stripped of rank when he voices his concerns, or Final Fantasy VI's march through the snow on the way to Narsh Village, or Final Fantasy VII's grandiose bombing mission, or Final Fantasy IX's tantalous kidnapping sequence, he seems to have a knack for grabbing the audience by the collar and yanking them into his worlds, giving them no choice but to keep going to find out what happens next. It should come as no surprise then that the opening sequence is always where he begins when writing a new story, even before he's written a plot outline or defined any of the characters. He's always concerned first with making sure that the opening scene establishes a strong hook for the story, and once he feels that's accomplished, he then moves on to building the story from there. For me, I start with the opening of any story, and 
not just opening, but the opening scene, the opening dialogue, what the characters are going to say in the very beginning of this scene before the characters are even that fleshed out or developed. Because I believe that the opening really sets the tone and defines the direction of what that entire experience or story or world is going to feel like. So I literally just start writing the opening scene. And once I ha have an idea of what the opening scene is going to look like, I start building out the, the world that surrounds it and almost the rules that govern this world. For example, is there magic in this world? Is there not magic? Do the other characters know of magic's existence or not? And in the case of Fantasian, it's a multi-universe world setting. So how many universes are there? How do you travel between the universes? There are a lot of rules that I think are important to define early on once I have the opening scene that will then govern how this world, how the characters can interact and what they can do inside these worlds. And once that is more established, I will start developing the almost story architecture, the story composition of the overall beats that will happen throughout the narrative. That's really interesting to hear because um, we recently did a, a long form analysis of Final Fantasy VIII. We spent a, a significant portion talking about the introduction to Final Fantasy VIII and pointing out the differences between how the intro was made in FF8 versus FF7 or 6 or 5 or, or 9. And I feel like with Fantasian, you can kind of see the DNA of how you structure openings. Um, and so it's just very interesting to hear that that's where you where you start. That's really cool. Kanji ga shita no de. Hi, so da ne. So da ne. Tashikani. Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Definitely, uh -huh. you hit that one on the head. It's the combination of all of these personal philosophies and approaches to game design that are evident in the DNA of Fantasian. And for anyone who grew up on classic Final Fantasy games, this will be unmistakable from the get-go. For many longtime FF fans who perhaps missed the spirit of those SNES and PlayStation classics, Fantasian will likely feel like coming home, and this is precisely what Sakaguchi wanted his players to feel. At the time he was making the last story, he decided to turn away from those orthodox roots to try something new, something more modern and contemporary. But after replaying Final Fantasy VI a few years back, he was convinced that returning to that traditional formula was the best path to creating the kind of experience he finds compelling. I think uh, that very orthodox RPG as a, a creator and looking back on, on my career, you could say I was really used to it in a way. And in the sense that I have 100% control over what I'm doing, I know exactly what needs to be done, how to construct it. So even as I'm writing the story, just on paper, I could already see or I have a vision of what the completed experience is going to look like. And there was a time in, in my career, I think right around the last story, perhaps slightly before and slightly after that, I thought to myself, oh, people want something new. We have to do something where maybe I can't see 100% of what the final product is going to be. And people aren't, the fans aren't going to be satisfied if we don't challenge the status quo. Um, but this time with Fantasian, considering, and I have thought to myself that if Fantasian does become the last game that I make, that I would be kind of okay with coming to terms with that. And one of the very kind of inceptions or sparks that, that created Fantasian was when I played Final Fantasy VI with some of my old colleagues on a live broadcast. And when I was playing Final Fantasy VI, it made me realize that the experience itself felt quite complete in spite of it taking a very traditional or orthodox method to the RPG. So with Fantasian, I thought, you know what, I'm gonna try making a game which I can see 100% what the final product's gonna look like. I have this vision, but I will make sure that I have complete control over this to craft it and sculpt it in a way that, that I see fit. And that's how Fantasian came to be. From the very beginning of his career, Sakaguchi's philosophy has been to create worlds that have a miniature garden feel to them, a tiny universe for players to reach into and find satisfaction in exploring every crevice. This was one of the leading reasons why he was adamant to keep 16x16 16 16 character sprites even when moving from the NES to the Super Nintendo, despite the fact that the hardware was sufficient enough to allow for taller characters and greater detail. With Fantasian, this concept has been taken to an all-new level, where the team actually built handmade physical dioramas for each of the game's maps. 
This, according to Sakaguchi, was done to provide an experience unlike what players typically see, one that had an analog feel to it, a special human touch. For me, that's, uh, it kind of goes back to a quite simple concept, which is this idea of discovery or exploration that you have in, in a lot of RPGs. And the reason why I was really, I guess, fixated on this 16 by 16 pixel idea is because if you scale the characters up too big, you're going to have to naturally scale the environment and add, you know, it's going to require much more processing on whether it's the NES or SNES, whether it be the shadows or this extra level of detail is going to be required. And a byproduct of that is a lot of the game's emphasis will then shift towards the visual expression, visual aspect. And when that happens, I feel that fun sense of discovery and exploration could potentially be lost, which is what kind of makes the games what they are. So, of course, we tried to make the game look as pretty as possible, but underneath that layer, you peel it back, there's always going to be a puzzle element that I think this attention to detail will always reward the players. And we try to make sure if someone explores something or goes down a, an alley, that there is going to be a reaction from the game and a reward from the game for the player's um, sense of curiosity. With regards to the dioramas and whether that's kind of an extension of this idea of creating miniature gardens, I, I think the dioramas came as this me wanting to bring in a very analog feel that this game was made by human hands. There's a very unique sense of kind of warmth that you get from the diorama type of visual expression that you don't from a lot of other mediums. And of course, there's also the fact that I personally like these little miniatures and, and these dioramas. So I think it's important to have this idea of creating a little garden for people in which to play. And with dioramas, that was really interesting and the experience was unique because I would see the physical object in front of me before we were really getting deep into the, the game making elements. So I could look at a map and say, oh, wow, we can have the players go here. Like there's some space behind this building. Let's build this out and flesh that out a little more. And it was a, a really interesting experience to kind of find new places to discover and bring people to and I guess that was a really good a good byproduct of us going with the physical dioramas for our set pieces. Of course, while Fantasia is very much an orthodox JRPG, there are still new ideas that make the gameplay feel fresh in their own right. One such idea comes in the form of the Dimension, a device the main character uses to trap enemy encounters to be saved for later. This allows players to explore areas uninterrupted until the Dimension is filled up at which point all the enemies will have to be fought at once. This introduces an element of risk and reward where the player can choose when to fight and when to explore at leisure. But if you wait too long, you could also get in over your head. In combat, you can also aim or arc many of the character's spells and abilities, allowing for targeting of multiple enemies at once, which adds a layer of strategy and planning, especially in tougher boss fights, that keeps the combat feeling fresh throughout the entire experience. The story follows the lead character, Leo, as he infiltrates a facility in a strange, mechanized world. After a magical explosion robs him of his memory, the player journeys across the world in search of his hideouts, called Toy Boxes, where Leo believes he'll find clues to spark his memory and remind him of his mission. All the while, portals in the sky open rifts to this machine world from the prologue, allowing a plague called Mecteria to spread across the land, draining the world and its inhabitants of their life force. It's in discovering the source of this plague, and the one who is initiating this invasion, that the player unveils the severity of the threat and the intentions of the one who is propagating it. Along the way, a colorful band of characters joins him on this quest, and in similar fashion to Lost Odyssey, there are even several short stories that play out in the style of a visual novel, detailing the backgrounds of these characters and delivering many of the story's most sentimental human moments. For those who have played Lost Odyssey, you'll know exactly what to expect from these sequences. At the heart of it all, though, is a story about balance, about achieving the right harmony between order and chaos, which is a theme that many fans of classic Final Fantasy games will be familiar with. In Fantasian, I wanted to really shine the spotlight on this 
balance between order and chaos. And ultimately, I think that that key word balance applies to almost anything in our lives and our universe. You take a look at the world as it is right now. There's just a, a huge gap between the mega wealthy and the average person or take religion, take ethnicity. But in between all of that, I don't think anything is as black and white as it, it may seem. And there's always going to be some kind of balancing act in, in there. And with Fantasian, I took this idea of order and chaos and the idea of finding a balance between the two of them, which also comes from my interest in a lot of more f the f physics. I don't know if, uh, you know, but I'm a big fan of kind of metaphysics, space and uh, outer space and, and the physics of the universe. And similarly, if there's too much order or too much chaos in our universe, I think that you know we're either going to expand too much or it could just reduce everything to zero if you go to one extreme or the other and we'll just the universe will cease to exist. But somehow the universe found this perfect balance between enough order and enough chaos that it's able to sustain this system in which stars and planets and things can exist, which to me is quite mysterious but also very um it's very attractive to me so be it this world of metaphysics or our own reality or our own society and how we've established uh the way we live i think there's a juxtaposition to be made between this idea of order and chaos and two extremes and finding the right balance between the two fantasian is available exclusively on apple arcade which I've observed has created some confusion among a lot of potential players online. First of all, while the game has been designed to be played on iPhone and iPad devices with touch controls, it is possible and absolutely recommended that you play with a controller via Bluetooth pairing. Also, while it may be tempting to pass this game off as just another mobile title, this plays nothing like what typically comes to mind when you hear that term. There are no gotcha elements, no microtransactions, or anything of that sort. Fantasian is designed and plays exactly like a traditional console JRPG, so if that was a concern you had, you can rest assured that's not the case here. Additionally, since it is an Apple Arcade title, it can be played on more than just iPhones and iPads. It's also accessible on Macs or even Apple TV devices. I played the game on an Apple TV that I borrowed, and the Apple Arcade service allows for a free one-month trial. The game has been split into two parts, with the second act set to release later this year, so in applying for that free trial, it's likely you'll be able to play through part one and get a good idea of whether you like the service and are interested in finishing the game when part two launches down the line. Considering this incredibly low barrier to entry, I would say that if you're a fan of classic Final Fantasy titles or Miss Walker's own library of RPGs, that this is worth downloading to try out for yourself. If you've had a chance to play Fantasian, let me know what you think about it in the comments. And if you'd like to see my full interview with Mr. Sakaguchi, there will of course be a link in the description.